Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and to being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 110, and this week we are looking at the life of Arthur Tudor a prince whose life was incredibly important because it brought together and symbolized the union of Lancaster and York. And yet what we remember most about him when we talk about him is his death and the impact that his death had on the kingdom and on his brother and on the future. But we also talk a lot about his virginity and whether he was a virgin and whether he wasn't a virgin. And a lot gets a lot of time gets spent on that. So this week, I want to look at Arthur, the person, the boy, the boy who lived until he was almost 16 years old, and talk a little bit about what his birth meant at the time and what his early life was like. I'm not going to get into his wedding, just because a lot has been written about that. So we're not going to talk about that. But in the book recommendation at the end, I there is a great book on Arthur where you can read all about his life and his wedding and everything like that. So I'm going to recommend that book at the end. So I also want to announce the launch of the Tudor Radio Network. Have you guys heard about this yet? The Tudor Radio Network is a new online radio station that I'm starting with the help of a number of other Tudor bloggers and podcasters and people who are experts in this field, also a a radio station producer. And I've got a lot of people helping me on this project, but it's going to be a a 24-hour-a-day internet radio station filled with Tudor talk shows. And by that, I mean some of the podcasts and also original content that we are producing and also Tudor music, because of course, Tudor music. And my radio program is going to be on there, the show that I have in the UK already. There's about six or seven different um, podcasters who are confirmed that they're, that they're going to be sharing their podcasts with the, sh- with the network. And we also have new original content, Tudor travel, uh, historical fiction, series talking to writers of historical fiction. So there's a number of things I'm going to be doing a current events show looking at current events through the lens of history. So check it out at tutorradionetwork.com. So here's the thing, I'm running a crowdfunding campaign to get some of the initial startup costs like the radio licensing and the broadcasting, all of that kind of stuff to take care of that. So at tutorradionetwork.com, there is a link to the crowdfunding campaign. And you can start out at just $10 is the basic level to come in. And if you come in with at $10, you get some cool perks. And you also get exclusive access to the station about three weeks or so before it goes live to the general public. So you get to be one of the first people to hear it. So go to tutorradionetwork.com to find out more about it, all the different stuff we're doing, all of the different people involved and find out about the crowdfunding campaign as well. And there's cool perks as you go further up, you can like sponsor an hour of the show and, you know, send in a message that you want to be played during that that time period. And so there's a lot of cool perks. So tutorradionetwork.com. Okay, let's talk about Arthur Tudor. Like I said, Prince Arthur is somebody who hangs over the entire Tudor dynasty by virtue of his death. Even when we talk about him in life, it's always in relation to his virginity or not. And what that meant 30 years later when Arthur's brother was trying to divorce Arthur's widow, Catherine of Aragon. But Arthur did live for 15 and a a half years. And during those years, he was the embodiment of the Tudor Rose, the personification of the union of the houses of Lancaster and York. And if you want to understand those early years of the Tudor dynasty, Looking at Arthur's life and how he was raised provides an additional layer of insight. And like I said, I'm not going to go into his wedding and the marriage negotiations because there's a lot of that out there already. But I want to look at Arthur's life early on and also what his birth meant for the Tudor dynasty and how Henry VII would have wanted to raise him. So Arthur was born in 1486, one year into the reign of Henry VII, after Henry won the crown by combat at Bosworth Field. Henry spent the period of Richard III's reign in exile in Brittany and France, but he would have seen how quickly everything could change, how quickly the monarchy could change. In 1483, at the beginning of 1483, everything was pretty stable in England. 
The Wars of the Roses had been going on, but since the early 1470s, things were pretty much in place. Edward IV's rule was stable. There was no reason to believe that the throne wouldn't pass to his son, Edward. And Edward at that point was learning in his own household in Ludlow with his uncle, Anthony Woodville. Richard had been successful, a successful magnate in the north. He had invaded Scotland, which had been really successful. There was no reason to believe anything untoward was happening. Edward was healthy. Things seemed set. And then, of course, Edward died suddenly in April of 1483. It was very unexpected. And Prince Edward, now Edward V, was summoned to London for a coronation planned a few weeks later. And that is where history changed again. Richard intercepted Edward, of course, claimed that Edward's mother's family was plotting against him, and Edward's coronation was postponed. Now, I'm not going to get into whether or not Richard killed the princes, because A, I'm going to tick off somebody either way if I say my opinion, and B, I really don't have a horse in that race, to be honest. But the effect that it had on Arthur's father was to show him just how changeable politics in England could be. So Henry's watching this from Brittany, from France, and he's seeing how quickly things can change. You can have things fully set up and established, and it could all come crashing down in a heartbeat. So Henry became a rival for the throne, and the Yorkist exiles flocked to join his court, this court that was this kind of made up court that just sort of started to appear. And Henry waited, learning about leadership and kingship, in part by watching Richard, whose administrative skills were really strong. Richard filled his leadership positions with loyal followers. And Henry saw that and he learned from that. Once Henry became king, he realized just how few nobles of national importance were personally not committed to him. He had been a figurehead for the rebellion against Richard, and now he needed to create and cultivate loyalty and prove to England that he was a worthy king and the rightful successor. He also needed to cultivate that same loyalty for his heir once he had one. Into this scene, Arthur came screaming in September 1486. Now, everything about the birth of this heir was orchestrated to be perfect. Elizabeth of York was just 20 years old. Her clear fertility was one sign that God was supportive of this new reign. 13 months after he took the throne, Henry was being given an heir. Everything seemed really great. They chose Winchester for the birth because of its history with the ancient kings of Britain, Alfred the Great, who envisioned a united Britain when he was still the king of Wessex. And of course, Winchester was his capital. But also Henry decided to name his son Arthur after the legendary fifth century king who led the Britons in their fight against the Saxon invaders. Arthur's famous round table, a table purported to be the round table, is actually still in Winchester. The city itself was rumored to be one of the possible locations of Camelot. Another is Glastonbury. Probably Glastonbury didn't carry the same sort of gravitas, and plus it was a lot further away. So they chose Winchester to be the place where this new Tudor heir would be born. Henry was giving a message showing that he was the rightful successor And that just like Arthur was uniting the British, after a long period of civil war, the country would be more prosperous under this legendary leader that was coming. Arthur Tudor was born at Winchester on the 20th of September on St. Eustace's Day. Now, Eustace was a patron saint of hunters and people who were suffering adversities. He was also one of the 14 holy helpers, saints who had a more effective route and a faster route to intercession. So they kind of had God on direct dial. So Eustace would have been a welcome protector for Arthur. Arthur was likely born a little bit premature. We can tell that not only because there was the eight month gap between the marriage of his parents and his birth. Now, of course, that doesn't say that they didn't conceive him before the wedding, but also because many of the leading people needed for the christening hadn't arrived yet. One of Arthur's godfathers, the Earl of Oxford, was very late arriving. He actually arrived during the christening itself. And when the messenger arrived with the news of the birth, he clearly wasn't ready to leave yet. And he had to rush to get ready. So that leads people to believe that Arthur was premature in his arrival. He was christened in Winchester Cathedral on the elevated stage so that the congregation had a great view. Of course, later he would be married on an elevated stage too, so that everybody could see this handsome prince and his Spanish princess. But here in Winchester Cathedral, you have the font, everything is on this elevated stage. The stage was covered with a canopy of state and nearby they had a fire to warm the sweet little prince. 
It was reported that the weather was very cold and foul, and senior yeomen of the crown had guarded the dais, but after the bishop blessed the font, the king's body servants took up the guard of honor. Henry brought together the Yorkists and Lancastrians with his own family, showing how it had brought together all of these former enemies in peace. Arthur was a peacemaker when he was only a couple of days old. Queen Elizabeth had had a rough delivery, and she had caught a fever at Arthur's christening. She had been waiting by the church for the Earl of Oxford to arrive and to take part in the ceremony, and she caught a fever then. Of course, we now know looking forward that childbirth would kill her on her 37th birthday, but that was still years in the future. She had very, very little time with her son before he was set up in his own nursery, and that happened around the 26th of October. So she only had about a month, maybe five weeks or so with her son. And then they stopped at Farnham on the way back to London, and they left little Arthur in Farnham. His nursery was made up almost entirely of Edward IV's servants, people who took care of the young children that Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville had had. Now that made sense because there were still royal children and structures set up for them. The Queen's sisters, Catherine and Bridget, were still under 10 when Arthur was born. So it made practical sense to take advantage of this infrastructure that was already set up to handle that. Arthur's nursery would have had a lady governor with four female servants known as rockers. A chamberlain was appointed to oversee the other officials. Menial work was done by yeomen and grooms. A sewer handled the meals and oversaw serving and tasting the food. One major theme of importance was to take care of Arthur's wet nurse and ensure that she was healthy. She was actually monitored very carefully, even watched while she ate so that physicians could ensure that nothing changed while she ate, that she didn't come down with any sudden symptoms and nothing seemed to bother her while she was eating. Elizabeth Darcy was the manager of the nursery. She had also cared for Queen Elizabeth and her siblings, and all of the members of the household were given generous wages, a recognition of how important their jobs were. Henry VII often has this sort of persona, This there's this narrative of him that he was that he was very tight with his money. And yet he was constantly paying these people who cared for his son on time and giving them bonuses, showing just how important their jobs were. Arthur spent his early years at his nursery in Farnham, but he began to transition out of the nursery at about three and changes in his household show that he was beginning to take the first steps in the learning the art of ritual, the very early stages of court diplomacy. By 1491, he had 11 yeomen and grooms of the chamber, and of course his wet nurse and rockers would have been dismissed. The young prince had lands and honors that were sprawled throughout the country. He was the Duke of Cornwall. He had a number of different titles. And by having those titles, he was starting to be educated in the art of patronage, of managing officials, of cultivating loyalty through giving out favors and managing land. And that was something that was really important for a king to do. So if you started doing it on a smaller level, when you were very young, that could then help guide you once you became king and had the whole country that you were using to cultivate this loyalty. He became a knight and Prince of Wales in a ceremony in November of 1489. He was just three years and about two months old. He was also then made a Knight of the Bath and Earl of Chester. This marks the official end of his infancy and the start of his more formal education. He moved to Ludlow in the footsteps of the Queen's brother, Edward, Edward V. Queen Elizabeth's brother had moved to Ludlow and had learned in Ludlow. There's a couple of reasons why Ludlow was chosen. First, this is actually a part of England that Henry VII had known well. This was close to where he was. He had grown up. He had spent a lot of time here when he was a ward, when he was very young, in this part of the country. So it was a place where he felt familiar sending his son. He also did want to emulate and kind of take after what Edward IV had done with his children. That was what his wife, had, Elizabeth of York, was familiar with. There were still servants in place who had handled that. So it seemed to make sense to kind of follow after that. Also, people saw Edward IV as the sort of last legitimate king. So because Richard III wasn't seen as particularly legitimate at that point. So it seemed to make sense to want to follow after what Edward IV had done with his own children. And we look at the idea of sending you know, a young child away from his family And we look at that and think that's really awful. I can't imagine if somebody told me I had to send my daughter away and she's five. But 
you know, it was really important for a king to be, for a future king to be separate from his family for a couple of reasons. First, if he had been with his family and had been learning from the same tutors as his younger brother, Henry, there might have been sort of rivalries coming up between the brothers. And that was something, especially after the Wars of the Roses, that Henry VII really wanted to avoid. He needed to keep that air out of and away from any kinds of family dynamic issues that he might come across, resentments that might kind of stew underneath the surface. He needed to keep his air away from that. He also needed to keep his air away from and above the political machinations. He didn't want, he didn't want Arthur to get caught up in all of the different intrigue at court. If anything ever happened to Henry and Arthur had to rule, it would be important that Arthur not have too many factions that he already be familiar with and that might be playing against him. So it was really important to keep Arthur separate from that. Also for disease, there could be a lot of diseases in the royal household. And of course, that's something that's very ironic given that Arthur died then. But that definitely was part of the thinking as well to keep him separate from the diseases and and the different illnesses that went through the royal household. And finally, just the idea that he was going to, he was born with the weight on his shoulders of having to rule by himself, right? So if you're going to have to rule by yourself, nobody else can help you rule. You can have advisors, you can have people like that, but it's a very lonely job up there, I would imagine, because ultimately it comes down to you. And if you're going to have to do that on your own, it really sets sets you up properly if you also learn how if you learn how to do it on your own if you start getting used to that if you start getting used to having to make these decisions on your own and also having your own household would let you train basically it was kind of like learning and training a, a smaller version of what the full court would be someday so managing a household yourself managing some of the politics within that and your your servants and and the people who were helping you was something that was really important for kings to understand. So why not start young with a smaller household of your own that you could manage? So that was the thinking behind this. We, of course, know that the other royal children did spend more time with their mother. There's the story that she taught them their early handwriting. And, you know, there's the painting of Henry VIII after his mother died of him just looking distraught. There's that very famous painting of the children and Henry VIII is in the background with his head on his shoulder, on his arms and just crying. And, you know, he's very close to his mother. So the other royal children were very, very close to Elizabeth. And they they did want to have him close. And yet it was very important for him to learn these skills on his own and to not have his family right with him to kind of get his wings early on. And so that was the thinking behind sending him away to Ludlow. Of course, like I said, it, it's where the Queen's brother Edward had gone and also a part of the country where Henry... Henry Tudor, Henry VII had been familiar. He was taught riding, of course. Riding was incredibly important. He would have been taught riding right around the time that he was learning how to walk, probably. He was also taught other military and chivalric arts. Later on during his wedding, when there were tournaments, he was an eager participant. He wasn't a participant. He was an eager audience member and definitely enjoyed that aspect of things. When he was six, a grammar master was appointed for him, John Reed. He had been the former headmaster of the Winchester School. And during the 1490s, Arthur also studied with Bernard Andre. That was his most influential tutor. I did an episode on the tutor tutors uh, a couple months ago. So I will link to that in the show notes too. And you can learn more about some of these tutors who taught the early tutors. But Andre took over formally in 1496 when Arthur was 10. At that point, Arthur already knew Latin and French. But Bernard Andre, who had been at Oxford, wanted to complete his scholarly learning with classical Latin texts and a more humanistic structure. Now, this was the most modern education available to a prince at that point. This is right at the height of the Renaissance, when these classical texts are coming back into vogue and reading the texts and the the translations of the texts is seen as really important, really in vogue, really, really fashionable. So Arthur was given that education. He was given this humanist education. Henry would be, of course, too, and, and the other children. But for Arthur, it was really important to read some of these texts and to understand these texts. And it was seen as very, very important for a king to have this classical knowledge. 
Bernard Andre wrote after Arthur's death that he was a very literate and noble person. He was very studious. And by the time he died, he could recite several great works of Roman scholarship and also translations of classical Greek texts. At the end of January 1492, when he was five, the king's privy purse expenses also record that an expensive longbow was purchased for Arthur. But there is no concrete evidence that Arthur was taught any military exercises in any way other than through the hypothetical in the classroom. Henry VII had seen how easy it was for an heir to die. Of course, Henry VI's son died in battle in Tewkesbury, and it was very common for nobles during the Wars of the Roses for their sons and, and fathers to fight together. And this was something that Henry had seen and took note of. And he wanted his son to have an idea of how to fight, but he didn't necessarily want him having to go through the same sorts of struggles that he, Henry, had gone through and having to fight for his crown like that. He wanted to have loyal men around him who would do that for him. In some ways, that was Henry protecting, protecting young Arthur and saying that, you know, he wanted him to kind of rise above that. And of course, we also know that Henry was very protective of his children. And later on with Henry, when Henry was the sole heir, he wouldn't let Henry take part in any tournaments or anything either. They say, of course, that that was because he was afraid of losing his other heir. But it's also very possible that he was just a really protective parent after everything he had gone through himself that he wanted to shield his kids from that. And of course, warfare played a really important role in Arthur's life from the way his own father had captured the throne. When England invaded France in 1492, Arthur was actually named as regent and governor of the realm. And Arthur sat at council meetings while the king was away for three months. This, of course, would have also been a great opportunity to learn the skills that he would later need as a monarch presiding over these meetings. And of course, he wasn't making the decisions himself, but seeing how the decision process was made and running the meetings and seeing that he was the one in charge of it. When he was at Ludlow, he didn't come back to court very often, and he wouldn't have been that close to his mother and father. He did visit Shrewsbury in 1494 and 1495, and in one letter, he asked the Burgesses to look into a case that involved the Blackfriars there. So he was very hands-on in his lands and very hands-on in the places where he was the Lord and, and was expected to be. He was in Coventry in 1498 and Chester in 1499. He also went to Oxford several times during this period, and he did make a ceremonial formal entry into London in 1498. But mostly Arthur was on his own with his own council made up of trusted loyalists and family. Like I said, it was necessary that he learn on his own. They also wanted to separate him from the royal household so that he didn't get caught up in the same political risks that were involving his father. This was also the period of rebellions with Perkin Warbeck. And we need to remember that, that things weren't always the most stable. There were a number of rebellions during this period that threatened the early Tudor dynasty. And it was important to keep Arthur safe and away from that, so that if something did happen to Henry, Arthur was far enough away that hopefully he would be able to have people around him who were loyal, who could be trusted, and who could help him rule, and who could help put down the rebellions. In 1497, the ambassador to Milan described Arthur as taller than his age with grace and beauty. They also noted that he had impressive Latin conversations. There is nothing in any portrait, contemporary portrait, that suggests that he was at all sickly. And I want to talk about his health too, since that is often the topic of discussion. You know, you get this picture of Arthur Tudor as this sickly little boy who couldn't consummate his marriage and was always sick. And, you know, that that's kind of just what you hear about Arthur Tudor, at least it was what I heard about Arthur Tudor. And, um, you know, really, there is no mention in the spring of 1502 or earlier that Arthur had suffered from any kind of condition, or that anyone had ever been overly concerned about his health. There are a lot of different theories out there from saying that he had testicular cancer to, you know, that he had these childhood illnesses and because he was born premature that there were these issues with him. Evidence of any kind of condition would have been hard to cover up, especially during the time when he was on display during the royal wedding of the century. He was up there on a stage, everybody was seeing him. If he had had any kind of serious issue during that time, one would imagine that the Spanish ambassadors who were watching everything very carefully would have written about it, or even that once they were married and went back to Ludlow, that the, the Spanish people who were still with Catherine would have written about something. It's just hard to imagine that during this period of 
five months or so before he died when they were married, that nobody commented on any kind of thing of, of Arthur being sickly. There just doesn't seem to be any evidence that Arthur was particularly sickly. It's likely that there was some kind of an epidemic that swept through and Arthur just happened to be a victim of that. Catherine also got sick, though she survived. There have been some hypotheses that perhaps the Spaniards who didn't have the same kind of immune system were more susceptible to catching stuff and they wound up, you know, kind of bringing it into the household. But who knows, right? There were all kinds of illnesses, all sorts of ways to get sick and die in 1502. So it's hard to say exactly what it could have been. But Catherine was also sick and Arthur died. So basically, once you start to dig deeper into Arthur's life, you get a fuller idea of this boy who is probably very intelligent, very studious, like his father, who took his role as heir seriously, who was involved in the day to day runnings of his lands, who seemed to care that his lands were being taken care of, and that people were being treated fairly, who was intelligent, who was learning, who was doing all of the things that an heir should do, doing it all away from his family and on his own, and doing it all with grace and with dignity and, you know, doing it at a time when it was there was very uncertain for the Tudor dynasty at that point, how things were going to go, especially in the 1490s with the rebellions. And so I tend to think that Arthur Tudor, you know, gets a bad rap sometimes in in the narrative of him. And then this idea that he was you know, just this sickly child and Henry was waiting in the wings to take over. So I hope that this little discussion of Arthur Tudor has introduced you to maybe a new side of him that you hadn't thought about before. If you want to dig deeper, there is a book called Prince Arthur, The Tudor King Who Never Was by Sean Cunningham. And that's what I used for this episode. And I highly recommend that you get it. It goes into much more depth than I can go into in a a short podcast. So I recommend you get that book. There's a link with the show notes as well. So you can check that out. So thank you so much for listening. Remember to check out the Tudor Radio Network, Tudor Radio Network com to learn all about the new Tudor Radio Network that is popping up on an internet radio near you. Thanks so much for listening, and I will talk with you again soon. Bye-bye. Blow, northern wind, a central baby sweating. Blow, northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoor te boord in Bauerbrieg, dat soli semli is on sea.